Hello everyone, I am Dr. Lahari Desai and welcome to this lecture on temporomandibular joint disorders. I have divided the learning outcomes into two different, um, to two, suit two different curriculums. The first one is uh, to classify TMDs or temporomandibular disorders, explain etiology, clinical features and management of myofascial pain disc displacement, arthritic conditions, ankylosis, and dislocation of TMJ. To perform complete TMJ examination and justify the application of different imaging modalities for TMJ disorders. The second set of learning outcomes would be to classify temporomandibular disorders, to explain the etiology, clinical features, diagnosis, and management of intrinsic and extrinsic disorders of TMJs. Essentially, both of these learning outcomes sum up to the same um, teaching or, or same understanding of TMJ disorders. The TMJ is a unique joint. It is classified as a dulimoarthroidal joint. It's diarthroidal as there are two joints and they are discontinuous articulations that permit greater freedom of movement. The uh, the word dinglimoid means it's a hinge joint and permits movements in single plane supported by collateral ligaments. In human beings, the condyle undertakes the translatory as well as rotatory movements while opening and closing the joints. The bones of the joint would uh, essentially be parts of the maxilla, which is and the uh, the external retinaeus. Uh, you know, mandibular fossa, articular eminence, and the uh, petrotympanic fissure, which you can see in the image here, as well as the stylar process. Um, there's another image which shows you the articulation which is formed by the mandibular condyle occupying a hollow in the temporal bone. During wide mouth opening, the condyle rotates around its axis and glides causing it to move beyond the anterior border of the fossa and the articular eminence. The articular disc of the joint is uh, um, again very unique. It consists of collagen fibers, cartilage like uh, proteoglycans and elastin fibers. The disc is thinnest in its center and thickens to form anterior and posterior bands. It helps to stabilize the condyle in the glenoid fossa. It's very interesting to understand that the disc itself is primarily avascular. It derives its blood supply uh, with, it doesn't have its own blood supply, but the adjacent muscles and ligaments are the ones which provide a blood supply to the entire TM joint. So you can see in the image here, the articular disc is like a thin fibrous area between the condyle and the, uh, the bone, the condylar bone as well as the articular eminence and the cavity in between these is, is the synovial cavity which is filled with synovial fluid. When we're talking about muscles of mastication which help in movement of the TMJ, that is the condyle, uh, <clears throat> the most four most important muscles of mastication are the meseta, temporalis, lateral and the medial pterygoid. The biomechanics of the joint, mandibular movement towards tooth contact positions are by the contraction of medial pterygoid, mesoter and temporalis. Posterior part of the temporalis contributes to the mandibular retrusion. Unilateral contraction of medial pterygoid contributes to a contralateral movement of the joint, that means a sidewards movements. And lateral pterygoid is the main protrusive and opening muscle of the mandibular. Translation of the condylar head into articular eminence is produced by contraction also of the lateral pterygoid. When it comes to clinical examination of the TMJ per se, like any other examination, it involves inspection as well as uh, palpation. In the inspection, it's important to assess the range of mandibular movements uh, followed by uh, palpation. And then there is a provocation test. Also, there is intraoral examination where you check the ability of uh, to bite, the occlusal wear, uh, cheek biting, any fractured teeth or restorations to understand whether the bite force is abnormal or not. 
so when we're talking about palpation of the TMJ, uh, it's important to uh, palpate the TMJ in the lateral and the posterior <clears throat> part of the TMJ. What are we looking for is tenderness, irregularities and synchrony of action between both the sides. Auscultation is also done for the TMJ where clicking of the joint uh, can be assessed. A click is something which is both heard and felt and so palpation also will assess, will enable us to assess clicking of the joint. But auscultation will give you a much clearer idea whether the clicking is initial, intermediate or terminal or reciprocal that is after the closure of the joint. So when I mean by initial, intermediate, terminal it or reciprocal, it means during the movement of the joint. During the opening position, if there is clicking, it's an initial. During halfway through, intermediate click. Closing, terminal and reciprocal is after the TMJ has closed. Crepitus also can be assessed using auscultation. It is a noise that is similar to uh, that we hear when someone's walking on dry leaves. This generally happens when the TMJ surface is the bone is resorbed, condyla head is resorbed, which results from arthritis or long-term arthritis of the joint. This is a, a video which you might find useful that I have recorded a few uh, years ago to help you understand the entire process of TMJ examination and examining a patient who comes to you with a complaint of TMJ. So this is just to make you understand the examination again. Maximum mouth opening can be assessed using uh, a sterile instrument, a scale. Um, <clears throat> this is generally measured by the distance between the upper incisor and the lower incisor edge. Also, the bite is assessed and the examination of the joint is done by either standing in front of the patient or behind the patient while the patient is sitting upright and the joint movements and tenderness of the uh, surrounding muscles or muscles of mastication is also examined. These are just some more images to make you understand TMJ examination, intraoral examination as well as auscultation. So the normal mouth opening is within the range of plus or minus 40 mm between inter-incisal distance. That is what is the 40 mm, that, that is how it is measured. And the normal lateral and protrusive movements are in the range of 7 mm. So the TMD guidelines recommend a 1 pound of pressure for the joint and 2 pound for the muzzle during examination. Palpation of the joint and muscle should be done with muscles in resting state. Let's now look at TMJ disorders, also called as TMDs. This is a non-specific diagnosis that represents a group of painful and or, or dysfunctional condition involving the muscles of mastication and TMJ. Studies have reported that well over 50% of adult population have at least one sign of TMJ dysfunction. This happens over a period of their lifetime. It's not that almost all 50% of the adult population will have it at, at any given time. 5-12% to of population suffers from a serious TMJ dysfunction at some point in their lifetime. So that is something very interesting because the joint is, uh, TM joint is something which we use every day, day in and out eating, chewing, um, and even uh, smiling, laughing, that is the joint which is used and hence it is something um, which could be subjected to um, dysfunction as well as pain. The etiology of TMDs is again multifactorial. Uh, it is un important to understand that it could be because of instability of maxilla and mandibular relationship, hypermobility of the TMJ, trauma. Now this could be because of dental procedure itself, oral intubation for general anesthesia, yawning very wide, hyperextension associated with cervical trauma, trauma of the neck. Uh, parafunctional behavior like bruxism, Tooth clenching, jaw grinding, lip or cheek biting also can lead to TMDs. 
Sleep disturbances are very closely related to TMDs. So generally, a patient who's come to you with TMJ pain, the very important question that you might need to ask them is whether they are sleeping well or no. Comorbidity in the form of other rheumatic uh, musculoskeletal or pain disorders may also coexist. Emotional distress and poor general health and an unhealthy lifestyle are also etiologies of TMDs. So a common example of a patient who might walk in would be someone who's stressed and not slept very well and also having a bruxism habit. All put together gives you an idea that the person might ha be ha suffering from a TMD. Pain sensitive structures are located in the ligaments and the muscles around the TMJ and pressure bearing articular surfaces as well as articular discs are actually not innervated. So the sensitive structures around the TMJ are the ones which actually induce pain. And arthralgia emanating from TMJ may be classified as ligamentous pain, retrodiscal pain, capsular pain and arthritic pain. So looking at the classification of TMDs, which is based on the research diagnostic criteria for TMD and American Academy of Orofacial Pains Diagnostic Classification, they've come up with a combined uh, classification which divides TMJ disorders into four categories. One is temporomandibular joint disorders itself, which has joint pain, joint disorder, joint disease, fractures, congenital or developmental defects of the TMJ itself. The second uh, part of the classification is masticatory muscle disorders, which is due to muscle pain, contracture, hypertrophy, trophy, neoplasm, movement disorders, masticatory muscle pain attributed to systemic or central pain disorders. Third is headache. Uh, <clears throat> and fourth is associated structures, under which you have headache attributed and coronoid hyperplasia. So it is important to understand that not only the joint itself, but the muscles, headache and associated structures, all of which can be contributory factors to temporomandibular disorders. And the main manifestation of these disorders would be pain and dysfunction of the joint. When I mean dysfunction, it means difficulty in mouth opening or even closing. So this is a more detailed classification of the one which I've just mentioned. As you can see, you notice that the joint pain could be due to arthralgia or arthritis. Joint disorder uh, could be due to disc disorders, hypermobility of the disorder or hypermobility um, or hypomobility of the disorder of, of the uh, joint. Joint diseases like degenerative joint diseases, systemic arthritis, condylosis, uh, <clears throat> osteochondritis, neoplasm, etc. Fractures are congenital developmental disorders like aplasia, hypoplasia and hyperplasia. On the other hand, the masticatory muscle disorders could be because of muscle pain, most commonly myalgia. It could be local uh, and myofacial pain or myofacial pain with referral uh, leading to te uh, due to tendonitis, myositis or spasm contracture, hypertrophy, a neoplasm, or movement disorders in, in the masticatory muscles. <clears throat> also, masticatory muscle attributed to, muscle pain attributed to systemic or central pain disorders. Headache attributing to TMJ or associated structures like coronoid hyperplasia. So now let's look at internal derangement or disc displacement. This is a common painful disorder of the TMJ joint itself. Uh, and <clears throat> most common ones are internal derangement and arthritis. Now what happens in internal derangement is it's an anatomic distribution of the disc condyle relationship and subsequent changes in condyle in the joint mechanics. That is something very important to understand. So what happens is the disc which is located in between the condyle and the articulating fossa there is an incoordination in the movement of the disc and the condyle. So what happens is locking or restricted translation, when I mean translation, movement of the condyle happens. Also, there could be condyle dislocation. That means a condyle moves out of its joint position, its, its uh, location where it's supposed to go back 
in and it cannot go back into that position. So it gets dislocated from where it's supposed to be. So when we're talking about disc displacement first, this is a very good diagrammatic representation of what is happening actually. The patient manifests with clicking or intermittent locking. When we're talking about locking, the patient is either not able to open completely or not able to close back completely. Due to a combination of articular surface remodeling, disc deformation and displacement of the condyle or disc, there is restricted translation of the condyle. <clears throat> you must try to understand that the term translation is used for the movement of the condyle. So generally, disc displacement is not accompanied by any obvious radiographic osseous changes because this is not a problem with the bone. It's a problem with the fibrocartilaginous disc that is placed between the condyle and the articulating uh, fossa. So what you can see in this image here is if let's say you start with A, the disc is displaced forward. It's supposed to be in between the condylar head and the articulating fossa. So what happens is the person has an opening click because the disc is getting folded and is in a location where it's not supposed to be. So somehow the patient opens the mouth, but when it's closing back, the disc is obstructing the closing again. So in this process, there is a click, which is an open click, and there could be a closing click as well. And now generally disc displacement, the click can be on one side or both of the joints can be involved. And there could be intermittent locking. That means the patient is not able to open completely. It's called as a closed lock. Or the patient is not able to close back completely, which is called as an open lock. So this is again a comparison to show you that anterior disc displacement, generally the disc is displaced anteriorly. That means forward. It could be classified into disc displacement with reduction or without reduction. Now, what do we mean by this? So when the patient is trying to open the mouth, if you look at the topmost image in a healthy joint, the disc should move along with the condyle and go back to its position when the patient is closing back. But what happens in, in anterior disc displacement with reduction is that the patient, while opening the disc gets displaced, it gets folded in the anterior part of the condyle and the patient is able to close back the joint but the disc is not in its original position. Whereas in case of anterior disc displacement without reduction, there is a gap if you notice in the condyle and the um, <clears throat> and the joint articulating fossa. So the patient, the disc is entirely displaced forward and the patient has difficulty in closing back and the disc doesn't come back to its position where it actually belongs. So these are the two types of anterior disc displacement with reduction or without reduction. So that was about displacement. Let's look at condyle dislocation. Now this is a problem with the condyle itself, with the bone. That means with the head of the mandible or uh, condylar head. What happens is open condyle dislocation results in an inability to close the jaw. That means the condyle dislocates from its uh, joint position and then you're not able to close back and hence the jaw is open. Due to a jamming of the disc condyle complex on the anterior slope of uh, the articular eminence and it can also be due to hyperextension of the disc condyle complex beyond normal maximum translation and disc rotation problems can happen that prevents the jaw from closing back. Let's now move on to masticatory muzzle disorders. <clears throat> this is not a problem with the joint itself, but with the muscles around the joint. What happens is it is associated with limitation of normal mandibular movements due to pain and stiffness. There is onset of symptoms which is associated with increase in bruxism or clenching due to personal stress and anxiety. Like we discussed previously, most AMDs have a stress or lack of sleep component associated with them. So myofacial pain of masticatory muscles, earlier called as myofacial pain dysfunction syndrome, is one of the most commonest masticatory muscle uh, disorder associated with the TMJ. 
there is a self self perpetuating cycle of stress pain stress that means first because of stress pain is induced which again leads to stress localized tender area in a taut band of muscle and a trigger point very importantly it means there's one particular area which triggers pain in the entire tmg region chronic microtrauma or consequence of overuse of the muscle can cause myofascial pain now when we're talking about micro trauma we mean constant trauma which is uh, in small amounts for example habits like bruxism or uh, nail biting habit or constantly sitting with your hands cupped over your chin and uh, pressure being put on only one side of the joint these kind of situations which cause consequence over you consequence of overuse of muscle and leading to a uh, a stress pain stress cycle the signs and symptom of myofascial pain are dysfunction syndrome as outlined by laskin way back in the 1960s is unilateral dull pain in the ear or preauricular region that worsen on awakening that means a patient wakes up in the morning and says that is having difficulty in opening the joint and the pain is worsen upon waking up because of habits like bruxing and the muscles which should have been resting overnight were actually working hard and hence there is overuse of the muscle and pain the next sign and symptom is tenderness of one or more muscles of the mastication this is again because of overuse or micro trauma of the muscles which leads to limitation of or deviation of the mandible on opening so when the muscle is overused it goes into a state of spasm and doesn't allow the mouth to open wide this can also lead to deviation of the mandible if the other side muscle is functioning normally and hence the patient is having pain on one side when it comes to treatment of myofascial pain it is not actually very simple there there are multiple factors that are involved in managing a patient number 1 is education and reassuring the patient and allowing them to perform self care reassurance is important because a patient might uh, under stress uh, not be able to get relief and hence it's important to make the patient aware that this is not a life threatening condition and will revolve resolve eventually self care will involve eliminating oral habits like tooth clenching chewing gum and diet modifications which may involve avoiding opening the mouth wide cutting the food into small pieces and eating during the period of pain especially physical therapy with heat and cold therapy especially given alternatively tens which is also useful for the muscles transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation uh, laser therapy and ultrasound therapy all of which help in uh, muscle strengthening and posture therapy general exercises as well as passive stretching can help to relax the muscles intraoral appliances like a soft splint can be given to patients who have a habit of bruxing but again it's important to avoid long term use for habitual um bruxers uh, because otherwise the tmg would get used to a new occlusion and uh, because of the presence of the splint pharmacological therapy which is inclusive of inclusive of nsaids muscle relaxants anti anxiety agents and tricyclic antidepressants a combination of all of these could help the patient also behavioral or relaxation techniques relaxation therapy hypnosis biofeedback cognitive behavioral therapy have all been tried in the management of myofascial pain so these are examples of a splint and some relaxation and yoga as well as the tens equipment which is used which have smaller uh, patches that can be applied externally over the muscle of mastication area and uh, the frequency is adjusted so that the muscles is small vibration felt and it's a sort of physiotherapy which can help the uh, muscle to relax and uh, <clears throat> help in healing myalgia on the other hand is dull aching continuous pain which increases with functional stress it's verified by presence of local tenderness on palpation 
also due to local, uh, local trauma, bruxism or complex myofascial dysfunction. Muscle splinting or trismus. Restriction of jaw movements due to an abnormal excitation or inhibition of muscle activity with opening. It's further differentiated into proactive splinting, uh, which is described by guarded mandibular movements due to pain or dysfunction of a chronic nature. That means the patient is not able to open beyond one particular point because the muscle has gone into a protective splinting mechanism, not allowing the joint to open wide. Traumatic or post-operative trismus can happen due to uh, post-operative trauma, especially if the trauma is involving the neck muscle or the jaw muscles or the head and neck area. Hysterical trismus is also uh, known to occur. Due to acute psychological distress, the patient is unable to open the mouth or unable to close the mouth because the muscles go into severe spasm. Arthritis <clears throat> in the joint um, is not in the TM joint especially is not very common but uh, pain increases with function and also there is restricted movement and crepitation we discussed crepitation earlier the causes could be non-inflammatory or degenerative arthritis inflammatory arthritis infectious or metabolic diseases so degenerative joint disease that is osteoarthritis is a disorder of articular cartilage and subcondylar uh, <clears throat> subchondral bone with secondary inflammation of synovial membrane sclerosis of underlying bone subcondylar cysts and osteophyte formation are a, a feature in this disease what happens is there is narrowing of joint space Flattening of the articular surface is seen. Osteophytic formations happen with the presence of LE cysts. And these cysts are like radiolucent areas which are seen within the body of the condyle. And they're best seen on uh, images such as CBCT or CT scans. Rheumatoid arthritis, on the other hand, in 40 to 80% of the patients, TMJ involvement is seen. Starts as vasculitis of synovial membrane and it progresses to chronic inflammation, eventually causing an erosion of the underlying bone. Anterior open bite and micrognathia are commonly seen in juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. Morning stiffness, joint sounds, tenderness and swelling over the joint are features of rheumatoid arthritis. Myositis, inflammation and edema of the muscle and facial tissues. Myositis is thought to be an inflammatory, non-infectious condition and swelling is believed to be secondary to severe spasm or prolonged trauma. Now let's look at condylar fractures. These account for 15 to 30 percent of all mandibular fractures. The image you can see here is bilateral condylar fracture has happened and the fracture has caused the condyle to move inwards and this is more common in edentulous patients. Based on the level of the fracture, the fracture could be at the head of the condyle, neck of the condyle, or in the subcondylar region. Ankylosis. Trauma to the chin is the most common cause, especially in children. Infection is also a cause. Children are more prone to ankylosis because of greater osteogenic potential and an incompletely formed disc. So what happens in ankylosis is um, the joint fuses to the condylar uh, <clears throat> fossa in the uh, articular fossa so frequently associated with prolonged immobilization following condylar fractures as well so chief complaint would be limited mandibular movement deviation to the affected size on side on opening and facial asymmetry so this is seen by the image over here where one of the side is ankylosed and the child is only able to open the other side of the joint I mean, there's restricted movement as well as deviated jaw movements. So this brings me to the end of this topic. I hope you have understood TMJ disorders, also called as TMDs. And for further information, please refer to this uh, YouTube video, which explains to you history taking as well as understanding uh, how to examine a patient with TMJ problems. Thank you for listening.